Great, there we go. Well, good morning to you. If you don't know me, my name's Dave. I'm the pastor here. And we're looking this morning at that passage in Matthew 8 that we had read together. So grab your, your Bibles and we'll turn our way to Matthew chapter 8. Well, why don't we pray as we come to God's Word together? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you speak to us. Father, we thank you that you speak words of challenge and words of encouragement. We pray that you'd speak and we'd hear from the Lord Jesus this morning. Amen. Well, I wonder if there's anyone here who has ever thought about joining the army. Anyone ever thought about joining the army? So apparently, to join the army, you need to be between 16 and 49. Um, you could perhaps uh, maybe make it up as you put it on the form. You need to be British or Irish. You need to be fit with no medical issues. You need to have no unspent criminal convictions. And you need to have no offensive tattoos or no tattoos above your collar. Uh, but if you match all those, then you could think about joining the army. But before you join, you might need to think pretty carefully about it. Because when you join, you need to agree that you've got to obey your commanding officer at all times. And not just when you want to. You sign over your right to live where you want and choose what you want to do. You have to sign up for a minimum of four years. And you have to agree that you might be posted anywhere in the world for unknown reasons for an indeterminate length of time. And that's a number of reasons why I'm, I'm not particularly interested in joining the army. But the passage we're looking at this week is all about signing up to follow Jesus. And I've got to give you a, a bit of a warning as we start the sermon this week. This is a challenging passage. It is punchy. It's all about following Jesus and it's demanding. And it's designed to make us stop and really think about following Jesus and what that means. There's some passages, aren't we, that that we study and they leave us really encouraged. And there's some that leave us really challenged. And this is one of those. So we thought about those significant steps about joining the army. Think about the, the commitment that it takes. And that's only signing up for four years or so, isn't it? And we're going to see today the commitment of a lifetime of following Jesus. A lifetime of following Jesus. So more than just a kind of one-off prayer, hand in the air, carry on as normal. Being a Christian, we're going to see here, is a radical, total, wholehearted change. Following the king wherever he leads. I look around this church and I see so many people committed to following the Lord Jesus. And that's wonderful. And we're going to see what Matthew's got to say about it. Now, if you were here last week, and we were talking about what is a, a gospel, what is this account of, of Jesus' life, and it's basically saying, who is Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? You'll hear that a lot through this series. Who is Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? And we saw last week that Jesus was the, the king with incredible authority and wonderful compassion the one who listens and, and does amazing things for his people. And we're going to see this morning more about what it means to follow him. And we're going to see this demand to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. To follow Jesus wholeheartedly. So we, we've come to this point, and these, these massive crowds are following Jesus. And if you remember, we saw this section kind of, is in between 423 and 9.35, which remind us, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness. So that's this section that we're kind of in. There are these incredible healings, these mighty miracles, the teaching. And now Jesus is follow his followers, and he's saying, come and follow me, we're going to go to this new area. 
And this teacher of the law, this scribe, comes up to him, doesn't he? Uh, Look with me at verse 19. This scribe, this teacher, comes up and says, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm so amazed. Uh, And in Matthew so far, the the scribes have got a bit of mixed reviews, to be honest. Uh, And we're going to see, actually, they don't end up looking particularly well. And so you'd have thought Jesus would be pleased, wouldn't you? I'll follow you wherever you go. Brilliant. Another disciple. Great. Right this way. You've made a decision you're never going to regret. But did you see, that's not what Jesus says, is it? Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, what's he saying? It's not a kind of, direct snub to this man he's not rude but he's basically saying are you ready for the commitment are you truly ready to be my disciple in language we might often hear have you counted the cost because the demand is to follow Jesus wholeheartedly if you follow me you should expect a life like me That means a life where there may not be settling down. There may not be a cosy nest. There may not even be a home in this world. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Now at this point, we've got a a little technical bit. So if you're less interested, you can take a pause. But it's really striking that Jesus uses this phrase, son of man. Did you see it there, son of man? And this is the first time that Jesus uses that in the gospel. Other people don't often tend to say son of man. It's mostly what Jesus says about himself. And it's really interesting because it's, there's one of two ways to look at it. And people read it in those different ways. So son of man could just mean human, that Jesus is simply a human being. Or it could be a reference to a passage in the Old Testament, to, to Daniel chapter 7. And we've not got time to look at it fully, but... There's this picture of this son of man figure, that this, this majestic and, and divine figure who's given all authority from God and glory and dominion. And, and you think, well, which one's Jesus using here? Is he saying, I'm just a human being like you? Or is he saying, I'm the divine one with all authority? And that's the point, isn't it? That's the great kind of mystery and, and wonder of the incarnation. That's Jesus' glory, isn't it? Because both are true. That that Jesus, the majestic Son of Man, enthroned in glory, all authority. We're going to see that in chapter 28. We've seen it already, haven't we? All authority given to him. It's the same Jesus who came simply as a human being, a son of man and woman with, with nowhere to raise his head, with human limitations, who in his earthly life received so little glory. And we see that time and again in the Bible, don't we? This this kind of putting together of humility and glory, of of emptiness and majestic fullness in God. This is the suffering servant, the son of man, living out his mission in these two together. And to follow him means following his humility in the hope of his glory. Well, if you switched off for that technical bit, switch back in. Because what is Jesus saying to this law teacher? He's saying, if you follow me, there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a cost. A cost of earthly security. A cost of of earthly honour. And it might be that as you follow me, you're left without permanent home. You're left without privileged position. You're left without worldly esteem. Will you count the cost and follow Jesus wholeheartedly? Because following Jesus means being ready to give up everything. Because that's what Jesus did, isn't it? Well, what does it mean for us? What does it mean? Does it it mean that each one of us should expect to to kind of become a sort of travelling evangelist and live in a tent? No, I don't think so. But it might do. Mightn't it? God might be calling some of us to 
to mission work overseas. He, he might be calling some of us to serve him in other parts of the country. He's certainly calling each one of us to pour ourselves out in love for his people. That might mean not living where we want to, but where we can best serve. It might mean saying no to a promotion so that we can serve him more. It might mean giving more so we've less to spend on ourselves. I don't know what it means in your life. I don't know where God is going to challenge you. I'm not going to tell you specifically what God is calling you to do. But he is calling us to, each one of us, recognize that the here and the now is not our permanent home. Hey, I've got to remember this. We've just moved into this new house and there's, there's loads that we could do. And we were thinking this weekend, do we move this or put this here or paint this or, or do that? But I need to remind myself these words. My home is not here. My home is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is just a, a temporary resting place. And God could call me to give that up. Because following Jesus wholeheartedly means recognizing we're under his orders. That his priorities become our priorities. And our kind of personal desires come underneath that, don't they? And to think of a very extreme example, how many of our brothers and sisters in, in persecuted lands around the world have lost their homes because they follow Jesus. Now, we don't think this will happen in this country, but it might do. There may be a time when we're called upon to pay fines or, or go to prison because we're obedient to the Lord Jesus. And actually, we don't have to look very far in the past in this country to find that what we're doing here, to, to, to meet together as a church, as a church that's not the kind of parish church, we would have been in trouble for that. We could have been arrested or fined. Certainly to meet together as a, a church like this would mean that we... We wouldn't be able to go to university. We wouldn't be able to be in government because there's a cost to following Jesus. And we just live in this tiny little fraction of time where perhaps we don't see that in the here and now in this country. But that's unusual. And this is a reminder of the, the cost to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. And if we think that's intense, well, look at verse 21. Another disciple came to him and said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Well, hang on. It's Jesus saying, I can't even go to my dad's funeral. I know following him is serious, but that seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? I can't go for a couple of hours to this important family event. And this picture of a kind of load of corpses burying a load of other corpses. I think to really get to the bottom of this, we've, we've got to understand the kind of burial customs at the time. So Israel is hot, right? And, and when people die and it's hot, you don't need me to go into a great amount of detail, do you? It gets a bit manky. And so they bury people very quickly. And if that had happened, well, the, the chances are this man have been, would have been and buried his father and it would have been done with. And it seems what this man is, he's either talking about a kind of more elaborate, more formal ceremony, perhaps when the body is decayed and the bones are kind of stored. Or what I think is more likely based on what Jesus said is, it is possible this is a kind of phrase and, and his father's not even dead yet. And what he's saying is, basically, I'll follow you but I need to go and sort out family business first. I need to, to get the family arrangements ready for, for my father. He's getting old and there'll be a time when he's buried and we've got to get all this family stuff sorted out. I need to be there. I've got my family expectations to meet. And then when that's done, then I can come and follow you. Okay, is that okay? And he's saying basically, Jesus, I will follow you but only when it's convenient for me and my wider family. Just, just wait, Jesus, for things to get a bit less complicated. And then what Jesus is saying, no, to follow me is to follow me now. Not when it suits you, 
Not when you think you're ready. Let the, uh, the spiritually dead worry about the physically dead. Come and follow me. Now, I've got to be honest, I've wrestled a bit with what he's saying here. How does this apply today? Because Jesus isn't physically here in front of us saying, you physically walk after me, is he? He's not saying, get in this literal boat. So what does he mean? What he's doing is challenging this attitude of, I will follow you, I will follow you wholeheartedly, but only after this, or or I will follow you, but only uh, to the point of family difficulty. And I wonder what this might be for us. Is there something in your life that is stopping you wholeheartedly following Jesus? Is there something in your life, perhaps, that's stopping you committing to Jesus right now? I'll follow you, Jesus, when I'm older. When I'm retired, I'll really be able to serve Jesus. I just need to save up a bit more and then we'll be able to give. I need to wait till the kids get a bit older and then I can really get stuck into things. Now we know that these are all pressures and there are times and seasons, aren't they? But Jesus is saying, the time and season to follow me is now. And that means following me above everything else, above family expectations, above what society thinks you should do, above our own comfort, Jesus is saying, follow me wholeheartedly now. Now, I want to be absolutely clear on this. Jesus is not saying, well, abandon your family and follow me. He's not saying, if you've got elderly parents or little kids, just don't, don't worry about them. Follow me instead of that. Other passages in the Bible are really clear about that. That to be a Christian means to be a more loving husband or wife, a more loving son and daughter, that we have a responsibility to our families. But he's saying it's not an either or. It's not either serve family or follow Jesus. It is that our following Jesus leads us to serving our families. Let me try and clarify it with an example. Okay, so at one point, Becca and I were in a, a different church, and it was an area where the people in the church had loads of their, their family nearby, lots of kind of interconnected families. There's some areas like that, aren't there? Some churches like that. And the expectation seemed to be that on a Sunday, you'd basically go and, and spend time with your family. Then that's not wrong, is it? But the expectation was so strong that, that it meant that hospitality and relationship in the church just wasn't as good as it should have been. Because this kind of family expectation meant that it was harder to love your brothers and sisters in the church. And what should have been a both and became an alternative. And I don't want to kind of criticize or be kind of ungracious to this church. And spending time with family is a good thing, isn't it? And they loved each other. But it became for them an either or. I know Jesus says this, but my family's expecting me to do this. And actually, the life that Jesus calls is to integrate this, that loving him means we love one another and we love our families, isn't it? And that's just an example. I I don't know how it works with your family. I don't know you well enough yet, so I'm not having a go at any of you. And you will know what that challenge for you is, won't you? And we need the Spirit's wisdom on this. But the the principle being, is there something you think, if I just do this first... Or, I know I should do this, but my family expects me to do that. What is it that's preventing us following Jesus now? Because make no mistake, Jesus means to follow him wholeheartedly before it's too late, doesn't he? Well, I warned us at the beginning, this is a tough passage. Uh, And if you're anything like me, you think, well, is this worth the cost? How on earth am I going to sort this out and manage it? Is it worth the discomfort? What happens when I fail? Well, let me encourage you that it is worth it. It is worth it. If we're wondering if it's too hard, if, if it's too discouraging, if we fail, it's worth following Jesus because he is the king with divine authority. 
He's the king with divine authority. We can follow him joyfully, wholeheartedly. We can put all our eggs in one basket because we can trust him. Now, we'll probably come back to these verses next week, but look again at verses 23 to 27. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're drowning. He replied, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So Jesus and the disciples, they they get in this boat to cross to the other side of of Lake Galilee. Not necessarily an east-west crossing, by the way, if you're thinking about the geography of this. And they're in this boat, and suddenly this, this furious storm whips up, and the wind is howling, and the, the rain is lashing down, and the, they're crashing over the boat, and the boat's going to sink. I've been, in a, been on a small boat in a big storm. The disciples are terrified because they know this lake. They know its moods and its storms. Apparently, it's because it's about um, 700 meters below sea level, It's very prone to this kind of sudden storm, apparently. And this is a particularly fierce one. And they basically come to Jesus and say, we are drowning. We're drowning. We're dying. And in the middle of this this situation, Jesus is asleep. What a picture of a man with total confidence in God. Knowing that God is sovereign. Knowing his work isn't complete. So... He can trust God to preserve him. And the disciples rush him and they say, Jesus, wake up, we're dying. And he says, he gets up and he says, oh my goodness. Well, good job you woke me. Um, and he doesn't say that, does he? He says, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? He's saying, do you not know who I am? Do you not know me by now? Do you think that the, the elements, the forces of nature, the chaotic sea... Do you think they've got power over me? Why are you scared when you're with me? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. See the incredible power, the absolute authority? The men were amazed, and they said, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. What kind of man is this? And, and Matthew doesn't really answer that question, does he? He just kind of leaves it hanging there for, for us as we read it to fill in the blanks for ourselves. Remember, who is Jesus? He is the one with absolute authority over nature. No ordinary man, no mere man. The man with the authority of God. That the power and authority of God are sufficient to amaze those who've been with him, despite what they've already seen. The king with divine authority. But as we think about this, think how these two truths fit together. This call to follow Jesus wholeheartedly because he's the king with divine authority. Because it is scary, isn't it? To be asked to make a complete trusting, wholehearted commitment to one person, to be asked to give up our lives and and to take up our crosses and follow him, not for four years, but for a lifetime. How do we know that we can trust him? How do we know that he'll keep us safe if we're not going to be in charge of keeping ourselves safe? And that seems to be where the disciples are at here, doesn't it? They know Jesus has got this power and authority, They are ready to get in the boat, but they haven't completely seen it yet. They haven't seen the the fullness of his power and authority. So the world still seems out of control and scary. And this is the reassurance that we need to take from this passage. That Jesus is the one with 
the authority of God over our lives for good, for loving care, for grace to us. That Jesus can be trusted. That we can commit everything to him. That he can be relied upon to keep us safe. That we don't need to fear the storms and worry about the future. We don't need to look after ourselves. We don't need to make that the top of our priority. Because he's the king with divine authority. Well, what does it mean when we're failures? What does it mean when we are half-hearted in our following? Because we are sometimes. I am. I expect you are. Well, we're going to see again next week that Jesus is the one with authority. Not just over nature. Not just over sickness and, and demons and all the forces of evil. But the full authority over sin. That promise of full and free forgiveness when we're half-hearted and selfish and don't follow like we should. That our failures have a king with authority to deal with them. That he has authority to take our past and our failures and our sins and deal with them by nailing them to the cross. This is the challenge and the encouragement this week that Jesus is the king who demands our all. But he's the king who's entirely able to be trusted with authority and complete compassion. Think of the storms of guilt and fear and failure that we confront daily. Only Jesus is able to deal with them. Why are you so afraid? Do you not know who he is? We follow Jesus completely because he is the king with authority.